Hello, everyone. Editing Bentley here. So um, last week, we did a interview with Lucas Bretz at LRB Aquatics, talking about filterless aquariums and his method and, and kind of his observations and experience and really had an, an awesome freeform conversation. Due to technical issues on my hand, you know, there were some difficulties in hearing Lucas's audio. So what I wanted to do for this week is just for the people that were really struggling with that, I went through and did as much work as I possibly could to clean that audio up, boost his level so that he's more audible. There's certain stuff that I just can't remove, um, you know, because Lucas, due to his own schedule and being super busy, was <laughs> in a car on his way back from this massive fish auction. So, you know, he's on a cell phone in a car. There's a few things. I did my best to cut out a lot of the disjointed stuff. But I just wanted to make um, kind of the replace our video for this week and and give that updated as best audio as I could give you for those that were having trouble uh, staying with it or following along, because I really think a lot of the information that Lucas is giving us here is fantastic. So maybe just put this on in the background. Uh, you know, it's it's great for water changes and stuff like that. And we'll talk with the man himself, Lucas, about his experience with filterless aquariums and uh, where where some of the benefits are, some of the things that you might consider trying yourself, and also why algae is awesome. The preface here, right, I put out a video talking loosely uh, about your kind of filterless aquarium method. And it's not necessarily specifically yours, because there are a lot of people who do filterless aquariums, and, and maybe filterless should be in quotation marks, right? For a number of different ways, whether that's like deep sand bed type tanks or a kind of a wall stead tank that you could do without a additional filtration method. But you're doing it on such a massive scale compared to most people. Most people do like one tank. You're doing hundreds, right? So I, I think it's worth talking specifically with you because there are a few of the things that I talked about in my video that you felt needed clarification or you disagreed with, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. And that's why we're here to discuss this, because I believe the whole hobby needs to talk about this stuff. That way we can clear it up and just have better understanding together as a yeah. whole. Yeah, and uh, uh, totally, totally happy to do this, man. Anytime I can I can yeah. chat with you is always fun. Well, so I, I the, the first touching the topics, a lot of other YouTubers are willing to do that just to save face and whatnot, you know, <laughs> I think. I think the, uh, my general approach, right, has always been we need to talk about the pros and cons to anything and let people make their own decisions. Um, because if we if we only say, like, oh, this is the only way to do it, like, that's inherently wrong. There, there's no way there's just one way to do something, right? There's always somebody who's going to come out of the woodwork, whether it's Indiana or Florida, and is going to do something completely different but have massive success. So us expanding that understanding and knowledge is critical let me let me give you the floor and just yeah, sorry. for your for your method that you've been doing since you moved especially right um what would be like the short summary of how you're finding success in effectively speaking a filterless aquarium okay so what really got me to this point is i was keeping a lot of ponds outside up north and so i was thinking about how those operated and worked and i saw how happy and healthy my fish were in these situations now i went to the full extent of making a customized huge sump out of a 55 gallon sterilite tub framing it out putting heaters in it like a big canister filter for the ponds outside and eventually that broke down and then i started seeing how my ponds reacted to with that filter being broke down and whatnot and just started learning about nature from nature and then i decided to bring that inside of my fish room what i do now what would you say are the necessary things that someone has to do in order to keep an aquarium without a filter and have success there's no real specific like special thing you have to do do it you just do it yeah, do you feel with your experience so far that you could do it without plants, as an example? Yeah, yeah, you definitely could. You ever been to, like, for instance, fish shows and how they treat those fish and keep those nice fish in those fish shows? Or they got them in these sterile water, there's nothing in there. Now they may not be comfortable, and that's what really messes them up, is the stress mm -hmm. situations. That will mess up fish and their immunities and how they feel. It's just not often people take that into factor 
Well, when you take that into factor, then you start adding the plants for more comfortability and things. So like as far as the plants being the ones that actually create the oxygen and doing all the work, it's not really true because I've had fish just packed into planted tanks that, well, if it pulled out all the oxygen, they should definitely be dead. Same with my shrimp. I've got shrimp with guppy grass wall to wall, just super packed thick and hundreds, if not thousands of shrimp in it with no filter. Okay. So in essence, they should be dead at night, right? But they're not because okay. know, nature has its place. So then let's let's talk a little bit on the plant side, right? Because uh, most of your tanks do have plants in them. Um, yeah. Do you do you feel, as far as what you found the most long-term success with, that there are specific plants to use for maybe if somebody wanted to try this as their first tank versus plants to avoid? Is there any kind of specifics in there that you've learned from your experience? So the way I look at it is you think about the plant's growth. And I know you're a big aqua horticulturalist, like you, like the man when it comes to plants, and you've done awesome work. Uh, somebody actually mentioned on Facebook recently about we're the two people who inspired them as the go-to guys for plants and stuff. So, oh, that's super awesome. About plants, yeah, yeah. And when I think about plants and the way that you're going to use them in the tanks for what you're really wanting to get out of them for your environment is like, so your fast growing plants, of course, it's going to absorb more nutrients. So say you get like a more nutrient rich well water or tap water, or whatever you're getting, those plants will be able to absorb that a lot quicker than like something that's growing slow, like java fern or nubius and things like that. So not all plants do the same kind of work as other plants. So like pearl weed and guppy grass, they're going to do a lot more work. And, and then some of the stems, like that's if you've got the stems going. So say you do got new stems and they're trying to rebound from like a transfer or something like that. They're not doing a whole lot of pulling power. They're doing a whole lot of staying power to be able to grow. Then after they grow, then they'll start doing more work as well. And, uh, yeah, I mean, plants do a lot for the environment, for the comfortability, and also I'll, I will use some plants for food for some of my fish as well. So my mascara barbs, for instance, um, let's see the, uh, what those trout goody ends, they love to eat plants and stuff like that, cichlids too. A lot of people think that you can't have big fish in plants, and there's just how you think about plants plays a big factor in your success with plants. Something that might be controversial for some fish people, because a lot of people avoid the dreaded A-word, algae. Whereas, you have a number of tanks where you're intentionally growing algae. Oh, I love algae. Uh, <laughs> I love it. So I wanted to give you kind of a little floor to talk about, like, where, outside of just your personal love, where do you think algae is super beneficial uh is there specific scenarios is it just all the time and do you have a target like if i'm raising x fish i want algae in this tank you know kind of talk a little bit about that okay so reason why i love algae for the fact that so if we didn't have algae i like to call it mother nature's great equalizer there's a lot of impurities that can come through water and whatnot and they actually help balance those impurities and eat off those just like bacteria beneficial bacteria do so just the fact that it helps us even as hobbyists if it wasn't for algae we'd be screwing things up a lot more so thank nature for even having algae that and it's the most universal plant in the world like in all waterways around the world you'll find algae like it's there and then yeah. as far as like with fish like we got so many fish the reason why i end up growing a lot of algae is i actually pump a lot of light for a long time now if i were to cut back my light i could have a lot nicer room without it i mean i i have it on from 10 to 12 hours a day so if i went to like six or seven or eight you know i, I would be in feed less but that algae what i love about it for the fish is one it's a food source but when it comes to breeding it is the best breeding media you can get for fish because i mean it's the most universal plant and that's the most comfortable fit or thing that they're are for breed on for a lot of like the egg scatterers like rainbow fish and tetras and other things that's a big reason why i like algae all right um good. without i mean you, you've touched green on this a algae. little bit green algae okay yeah so not not a fan of black green algae 
Yeah, no. I mean, actually, it can look cool. I seen Eric Bodrock. He had one of the coolest looking. And Rachel O'Leary had a real cool tank with her Hillstream tank that turned yeah. all Blackbeard. Or, no, it wasn't her Hillstream. It was her Bicer tank. Cool tank. Yeah. Uh, my, my wife wants to do a Blackbeard algae aquascape. Oh, they're beautiful. I love them. I yeah, love she them. loves the way it looks. And she's she's got this yeah. idea that we're eventually going to do down the line with a, a small tank for her specifically with Blackbeard algae. I think it would be interesting to see how you guys make that possible to make it purposefully. Yeah, I, thankfully, like Seattle's water actually is really easy to cause Blackbeard algae in it, uh, especially if you induce a reasonable amount of blue light. So it's it's very possible to kind of force it into a tank if you want to. I wonder what okay. the big trigger. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure because there's so little in our water. But maybe that's yeah. part of it is that once you're adding things to it, it makes it easy to find one piece of excess for the blackbeard algae to thrive onto. I I haven't like truly cracked that code. I just know that if I really want to, I can get blackbeard algae like crazy if I want to. <laughs> So you touched on this a little bit, but without the use of an air stone, because so many of us think about like oxygen levels, especially with something like a rainbow fish, where they're used to relatively oxygenated water. What, what do you, from your experience so far, what is it that le- allows nature to just figure it out? Like, is it just plant density somehow is doing enough? Algae and density is doing enough? Uh, is there some natural way where fish know if the water the air level is low enough they start hitting the surface more i mean talk about that a yeah little. so my ra- rainbow fish don't like go up to the air for or yeah go up to the surface for air so i don't have them like doing that now when if your fish are used to it like say you had a ton of rainbows sometimes they'll gasp if you take off the air and if it's overpopulated then that's kind of a sign saying that like there is too many fish in there or they're just not used to it. So I don't know if there was some adaptability for the rainbow fish, but like, I don't know. Yeah, I, it could be different for me because I've been doing it for so long. Maybe my rainbow fish are used to it or nature has just found its way. But if you also think about natural waterways, like rivers and streams and creeks especially, they have dry seasons and often sometimes they just become pools here and there where there's just a deep pool left. So when I was a kid, I used to play in creeks all the time and I would see how the seasons would change out there. And it, you know, you get all those fish packed down into this one little space where there's like thousands of fish and pretty much a no filter situation. It's just all algae water. And it's usually the heat that'll take out all that oxygen and now i don't use heaters so i'm usually at mid 70s so i'm not like running over hot tanks too that may have some factor in it i don't know but i could keep a big 240 gallon that was 86 and i 86 degrees and i didn't really have any issues with that per se but i know like high heat can cause issues but in an aquarium that most people keep they don't they're not really running into that issue. But yeah, just think about how it is out in nature in those pools and ponds. If you guys have ever seen fish get trapped in those little puddles and how many live in there, think about that and like the concentration. And they're all yeah. alive, you know. Then it's just a comfortability thing because they're just too smashed together. That's why you don't see a lot of, like my tanks are really loaded with fish. It's not the fact that I can't load them with fish it's just i i've got so many tanks i don't have to at the point you know there is some tanks that do look loaded with fish it's just not, not all of them look that way and usually people just see what they want to you know yeah so i want to talk a little because you're you're kind of segueing into that when it comes to like fish density um you know you've mentioned you've had shrimp tanks with tons and tons and tons of shrimp and in general, a lot of the tanks that we tend to see, but it's not all of them, just because, again, as you said, you have so many tanks, we don't see super heavy stocking. You've you've been doing this long enough. You've had enough tanks. I mean, can you have you had examples where you've had fairly high fish density in a filterless aquarium and still seen the level of success you see with, say, your lighter stocking tanks? Um, so... As far as like breeding, I mean, you're just keeping them at that point when they're all smashed together. You're definitely not going to get much for breeding because, I mean, just the societal behaviors of them are going to be a lot different because hierarchies within 
fish change a lot but as far as like samples like i've got so many inler tanks which inlers are kind of different because they're like really easy fish but if you go inch per gallon tank there's so many inch per gallon tanks that i have of all kinds of like rainbow fish blue eyes like cichlids um all kinds of different fish that would definitely break the one inch per gallon within the tank so a lot of it is just yeah i just know it's a new fish room too like give me a year wait till you see how many fish are gonna be in there so you know so i guess maybe that segues into part of it it maybe it's helpful maybe we just don't know because it's not enough time um but with you naturally having a fish business right you have a kind of build up then thin down then build up then thin yeah. down that and naturally people, occurs yeah a lot of people don't understand that so yeah i'm showing a fisher and that gets plucked on every week and plucked out of and my biggest thing is keeping up with everybody so um yeah i have to cycle certain tanks for like this plant or that plant or like this fish and that fish or it just it just goes out like super fast and that's why i try to specialize on rarer fish because I don't really have time to I think that there's enough people breeding the common stuff that we need to work more on conservation on like certain lines of rainbow fish that just really hard to get just absolutely fish. like the glossolophus maculosus you know I don't know, yeah, I know I mean, story. for a short behind. period of time you you were the only guy in the US that had any left yeah so how scary is that like that fish could have been completely gone and for those who don't know what a glossolophus maculosus rainbow fish looks like it's an amazingly beautiful fish and both females and males have color that are really predominant and it's spotted so it's a very unique fish yeah I, I think honestly outside of maybe one or two other fish total where you would think something like the emerald or the red dragon they have some of the most unique features with that spot pattern. You know, with the with the emerald and the red dragons, it's their finage, but it's one of the more unique rainbows that's out there because there's no other rainbow that has a pattern like it. Yeah, yeah. Those are beautiful fish. So do you do you think that like a more standard hobby is somebody that's maybe not as actively breeding and selling? Uh, maybe they're like a an at home breeder would have the same level of success when they're not kind of constantly plucking fish out of those tanks to keep the stocking a little thinner, so it's not getting super dense. So I actually never like pull fish out of a tank just because I think that the stocking is too dense. Okay. Um, my biggest problem why I don't get a lot of numbers out of like my rainbows or something is because I don't have the time to pull those runners out, and if anybody who raises rainbow fish know that the runners will eat the rest and so i'm i'm essentially living off the crumbs of the fish room right now because i've been in build mode so whatever gets community bred or just moved out of a tank and that's what pops up afterwards that's what i've really been living off of <laughs> yeah 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 it's really wild to think about but soon i hope to do more target breeding and you guys will see a lot more examples of like how and what can work but i never go into aquariums like trying to pull out for less density thinking that that's an issue because okay. actually if you look at my 470 gallon pond there's like a ridiculous amount of fish in there there's probably hundreds of shellies like the different types of fish in there it's just it's bananas do you do you think there is a water volume I guess I would say minimum to where you can go filterless and start to run into problems. Um, like, like if you're talking like a five gallon or something, some of those super small micro tanks, do you think you're going to have more problems there? Or do you think it's just a matter of understanding some of those balances? So the way I would look at that, think about that is just like normal overstocking tips, you know, like you don't promote overstocking really for aquariums or, yeah, I mean, some people like to smash them in, but for the most part, like, that's not like a major promotion for right? people because it's going to make it harder for their success because what usually comes out of that isn't so much the lack of oxygen, but more aggression and fights for space. 
I was just saying, so different issues may arise than what we would think that may be the culprit. Often, like, same thing with when it comes to fishes sh showing signs of what we may think be disease, but it could be a simple cut that just got it some kind of infection, and then we'll go throwing everything into the tank, destroying our beneficial bacteria, and ripping things up, and causing all kinds of heartache within the cycles of the whole aquarium, which makes it a lot tougher. But when you're keeping these natural environments, you don't really see that as much, or it's a lot easier for these fish to naturally bounce back from hardships. And I actually just quit trading. Um, as long as like I quarantine everything, and I make sure that there's like no internal parasites, and that's really the big one. Um, they're safe to go into the barn. And then after that, if like something did happen to a fish or like, because fish have like fish cancers, they have tumors, they have cysts, just things happen. And so I never dose anything in that uh, whole fish barn because it will either, nature will take its course, it will either fix its way. I've seen so many fish that you would just think would die, but they don't because just nature, like it naturally heals yourself. Like they, they have like the world's been doing this has been designed and coded for such a long time to do what it does. Yeah, you, you basically beat me to a punch on another question is when it comes to illness, right? A lot of our natural instincts is figure it out and medicate. Whereas, you know, you're talking about yeah, nature just does the thing. I don't use medicine. Um, do you happen to use, uh, because I don't know if I've caught too much of this. Do you, when you do see problems, do you use either like salt or some botanicals at all in certain cases? Like catapa leaves is an example. No, no, just but, nothing at all. I mean, katapa, uh, no, but catapa leaves, I mean, they are an antifungal. So if you are like raising eggs and babies and you want to try to keep anti like bad bacteria away or fungals away, they are good for things like that. But I personally don't use them specifically. Okay. Just because, I mean, I know my water and I keep my water. I'm actually using dirty well water full of iron and sulfur. It's, you should have seen it when I first moved there. It was so nasty. <laughs> I think I watched some of your stuff like right when you were first getting set up. Uh, I must have missed that part because I I was curious what the the base water because you've been making some changes like you are putting in a water change system and I think you're you're using some RO as well, right? Um, no RO, no. So I've got a 170 TDS that comes out of, but that all okay. runs through lime rock through my well and aqua. So it's fully mineralized. So it's slightly acidic and it's got minerals, which is just perfect for aquarium keeping because you have that acidity to break down all that mineralization to make it easier for the fish and plants to absorb, especially plants. But like the water change system, big reason why I have that is a lot for the plant growth. So when you're not doing water change systems, some plants will just blow up when you're not doing water changes and they don't care but some just won't move like mosses they don't like no water changes so if i start doing water changes and i get moss going and other stem plants will start growing faster like they'll be in a homeostasis the stem plants will but when you add those water changes they're able to grab that oxygenation it does a lot for them and you know it can help grow out uh fry and fish faster too so Having that water change system all by valve makes my job a lot easier. And, you know, I did the route of no water change to see how that really worked for a long time. And, you know, they are good to have. They definitely are good to have. So, um, speaking on that, like, because another big topic has been uh, not necessarily of videos for this purpose, but has been like the no water change. Uh, you know, you've done it for a while and you're transitioning to include some water changes. What do you feel is at least your target for now, the rate of water change you want to do? So it would really depend on the tank. So if I had like a planted tank and I really wanted it to grow, like I would definitely be doing weekly, if not twice a week, because the more you change that water, the more those plants are going to grow. But you don't want to overdo it to the point where the plants are always in that state of like oh growth state you know like just like if you're exercising you just can't exercise forever you got to have a rest break 
So if like say with all my aquariums, um, like shrimp and stuff like that, if I want to do something else with my time, I don't have to stress like, oh, I need to water change this week or that week. I can go monthly, bi-monthly, you know, and it really depends. So if I've got fry tanks, I'm gonna, of course, want to grow those or do more water changes out in them for more growth. But if I got breeding tanks, I'll want to do less water changes because I'll be disturbing them less. Uh, so I want to show this particular comment from chat. This is from Ginger Graves. Uh, I found it easier to go filterless with smaller fish. My Oscars don't like it. Honestly, neither do my rainbows. I'm not sure how Lucas does it with his rainbows. Um, what? What's talk about your experience? Because you have some fish that are are quite a bit bigger on top of your rainbows, and they're all doing relatively limited water change and filtration for a long time. So, um, you know, I don't know because it's hard to speak for other people's experiences with what they're doing. And I mean, I've got some huge rainbows, which like seven inch, almost eight inch rainbows that have been like chunky monkeys for like a long time. And you know, they all did all right. I was thinking about getting some Oscars, but I don't know. We'll see about that. Um, I personally haven't tried Oscars, but yeah, I don't know with the rainbows. I mean, the rainbows do like flow, so I would say it's not so much the air for rainbows, but more like the water movement passing the gills. So if I wanted to go filterless, I don't know. Technically, an air pump's not filterless. And another reason why I decided to go filterless was if you think about your fish, They've constantly got that humming noise, you know, in their aquarium, and it's really hard for them to relax. And once again, it becomes comfortability and immunity and all that when it comes to that. But yeah, rainbows do like flow. Some fish like flow. Same with my barbs. So, right? so my barbs are a lot like the rainbows, too. They're actually more finicky than the rainbows when it comes to no filter. In, in those cases, would you look at something like a power head or a circulation pump just to get water movement within the tank? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that would be enough. Yeah. So maybe that's the maybe that's the clue. Is it's not necessarily a filter. It's just making sure we have some water movement. Yeah, for certain fish, they prefer that. Yeah, it's not completely necessary, but they do prefer it. Uh, and you know and, that all depends this on is, your budget. Yeah, yeah, budget, of course, will play into almost every aquarium. Uh, this is kind of a good note and question. Uh, is some fish really like water changes when it comes to triggering breeding? So plecos, corridoras are great examples. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about that regard for yep. the filterless aquarium? So, yeah, water changes definitely help trigger breeds for many fish. Definitely um, no filter as far as making a difference with that I don't think it makes any difference but yeah no they yep. definitely some fish like like even rainbows will trigger because it's like a seasonal thing so you got to think about like when's the most rain come in during the spring like especially being down in here in Florida like we'll go weeks without rain sometimes but sometimes it'll rain for like a whole week and, yeah you know, certain triggers like that will help trigger those breeds the thing I like about no filters and triggering fish is you do get a lot of like more food web things. So when you're running filters, you don't get as many microorganisms and like daphnias and things like that that you can use to help trigger other fish to breed because things like daphnia once again is a spring signal to say, hey, now's the time daphnia is around um, for breeding. That's what they've been doing for eons. No. In, in regards to your, your previous experience of trying to do it without water changes, were there certain fish you saw that just your breeding slowed or effectively stopped because water changes weren't occurring in those tanks? Yeah, yeah, I would say it slowed, definitely. Do you think part of that is the that just like topping off to keep water volumes high enough is not signif significant? You would actually need proper water changes in those cases? Actually, what I think it is, is once again, a comfortability thing. So like, say if that fish feels like there's not any water coming in and the water level's getting lower, you're not even doing top-offs or anything like that, like that's kind of, 
their natural. I'm sure they got kind of some kind of like regenerative trauma response to that, to where they're not going to feel like oh it's breeding time so much. So it's like signaling oh now it's breeding time. The part to where when uh, water changes is like rainy, you know, there in the spring. If we're trying to take it outside of the realm of fish. Maybe we think about it like when animals are prepping for, say, like hibernation, they're going to save resources yeah. as much as possible and not focus on reproduction. Exactly, exactly, 100%. And you know a lot of fish, too. It's hard to tell when they're producing and not because, I mean, they spend a lot of time doing what they're doing. I I had a an experience in, like, once... This is a spoiler for a fish room tour I've got coming up, but um, I have a tank that basically just is a army of bulbitis and has a few random plecos in it. And I never expected any of them to breed, but I put in a few caves just to make the males happy because I could tell they were a little more stressed and not coming to the front for food very often without caves. It was in there feeding. It was like, that's a... Uh, that's baby plecos. Well, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> you gotta love that. You gotta love that. And you know, you yeah. looked at it. In the, you looked at it in the right perception to where you saw that your male fish were kind of stressing. You were like, "Oh, I'm gonna make them more comfortable." And you know, that's what that's what it really comes down to. Think about your fish's comfortability. I think uh, there's there's the the great great philosopher Eric Bodrock, be the fish, right? Yes, yes, hundred yeah. percent. I thanked him not long ago in a text, just like thank you so much for teaching me about being the fish. Like him and Regina, absolutely beautiful people that helped open my mind into a lot of like. Now they're not they're definitely filter people, and I still boggle their minds on what I do too because it is different, but. Like, they're really the ones that really helped me with that a lot. Because that's what got me thinking about my outdoor ponds, being those fish out in the outdoor ponds, and then bringing all that philosophy into the inside, you know. So, so put one up. Oh, yeah, big shout out. I, I, I've watched a lot of stuff with Eric. I, I love, anytime he's, anytime he is on a camera somewhere, there is always something you can learn. Oh, yeah. Whether, whether he's trying to intentionally teach something or not, you can always learn something from that guy. Uh, so, Laura started with a deep substrate wall stem type nano tanks and has ended up back in tiny sponge or nano hang on the backs just to get water movement, uh, especially when it comes around feeding, uh, feeding things like frozen or pellets so that they will maintain float and distribute. Yeah, do, you, I mean, do you want to any issues when you're going without water flow with food distribution, or is it I mean, you use a lot of tetral granules. You're well known for that part. Is it just naturally spreading it out to make sure it's okay? So that's what I like about that, though, is that some stay on the top, some finally go down to the bottom, because it actually has time for the fish to get it. So if it constantly just goes down to the bottom, a lot of fish, especially mid swimmers, top swimmers, they're not going to go down to the bottom and eat it. And it's actually not good for them to eat like that for some of them because it'll mess with their swim bladders and whatnot. But that's why, I mean, I like the no filter. It takes time for the food to fall down. They can go find it. It's easier for them to get it. And another thing with like a, like that, sponge filters aren't as bad, but you also got to think about your filter as like a treadmill. So that current, that fish has always got to be in that current. Um, you should also think about giving them a break space for it if you do keep filters because um, you often see like a certain point in your aquarium where all your fish huddle in this spot because it'll be either their chill spot where they're not fighting the current or playing in the current. If you see that become overcrowded, maybe add another break spot from your current so you can separate them from being too territorial and stuff like that. But uh, oh yeah, when you're keeping a filter and flow, just think about how comfortable they're going to be within that tank so they're not just constantly on that treadmill and once again it's comfortability and that comfortability is linked to their immunity 
here's a good one. So you have you have the benefit of wonderful Florida weather when it comes to fish, especially tropical fish, where you've got basically year round tropical temperatures. What if we're talking about people in an ancillary use to live in one where you have big seasonal weather shifts or maybe you have a much longer cold climate? Is there a risk associated with a filterless aquarium, especially if you're trying to do like no no flow or no air with trying to keep those tanks heated with like a heater? Yeah, so no, I wouldn't say so. Uh, my old house was all filterless by the time I left. And I never had any issues. And you think about it as like metabolism. Same thing with the metabolism of your fish. The hotter it is, the faster metabolism. The colder it is, the slower it goes. And that's the only difference. And that's going to happen whether it's filter or not. Okay, here's a good question from uh, Leo. Uh, is it mostly only heavily planted tanks that do best when you're using a no filter system, based on your opinions? Um, if you're trying not to grow algae, but that's the same thing with a filter tank. So it's the same principle, so heavily doesn't really change the difference because if you have a heavily planted tank that's no filter, I mean, how much space do you have for your fish? How comfortable are they? Same thing as if it had a filter. I would say there's no difference between filter or no filter. On that. I guess that the becomes the question becomes if you want that that natural assistance, that natural kind of crutch, it's either plants or algae. You have to pick which one you're comfortable with. Right. And that's whether you're doing water changes, what kind of maintenance you're doing. Are you pulling your leaves out when you're doing your water changes? How well are you maintaining your environment to keep from feeding that algae and what that algae is eating off of? Same okay. thing with if you're feeding too much or if you got it overstocked, you know, you would have the same problems. Do you, do you ever worry about detritus buildup? No, no, not at all. Never, no. That's actually a majority of a lot of fish's gut biome. It's detritus. So there's so many goods and snacks that come off of that, and that's actually what's cleaning our water and help purifying it. That's why I could keep filterless goldfish, too. And it looked like a decent tank because there's enough mold and detritus in there to work off other balances so it's either like you're going to have detritus or you're going to have algae too yeah I, th I think it's interesting i don't know whether it's a, a symptom of like the 80s understanding of fish or maybe even earlier where we we have it in our head we need to vacuum out all the dirt out of our out of our substrate all the time whereas you know for me especially like i love crips so every time I see a reasonable amount of mold in my substrate, I'm happy because I know my crypts have a perpetual food source. Oh, yeah, they love that. You know, and, and it, again, like you said, it's this massive breeding ground for microfauna and bacteria that in the end is what a lot of our fish eat in nature as is. It makes up a large portion of their diet. Yeah. And, uh, you know, oh, I forgot where I was going to go with that. But like, they'll yeah, come back to you. Going. Some big love for you. It's like loving, uh, loving our chat. Uh, LRB is a very knowledgeable guy, but it goes to the extreme. <laughs> <laughs> That's the point, right? That's how you learn. That's how you learn. You know. And and this is a broad topic because I, in my video, specifically said that my personal opinion, and this is based on my experience, which is very different from your experience, is that going filterless kind of to me, requires a level of knowledge and understanding. But when, when we were talking in comments, you disagreed. So I want to give you total open floor. Is there a minimum amount of experience, knowledge, whatever we want to call it, that you think someone should have before they try to do a filterless aquarium? So I would say just like any beginner, any person getting into aquariums, I mean, I know how easy it is to impulse anything, you know. And I would say a no filter is better for those who do impulse things. Because you're going to have more of a natural environment to help balance impurities and things and messes up. And like when you try to pinpoint parameters and all that stuff, that's what causes a lot of problems. And I've been telling people that in my talk all around the country. That's like my biggest thing is... 
like when you're a beginner you're trying to pinpoint ph you're trying to pinpoint this which it's great to understand your water but when you start messing with a lot of this that and the other you're not really learning about being the fish so with the filterless tank you're going to learn more to be about the fish but if i mean even if you're doing a filter tank it's just as good because you're, I mean, you're getting into the hobby, but it's going to be a lot harder to cycle and get that tank nat natural and mature compared to a no filter aquarium because it has more time to like cook. It's not like being moved around. I don't know why that is, but I mean, it just is. So I don't think that it's like an experience thing. Like just because I have all this experience, I'm able to do it. I think it's more of a perspective and what is sold and what is told and it's just it's out of the norm and that's why I get like not a whole lot of traction on what I do because not a lot of people understand it and it's not what they're being told especially if I start talking about pH or hydrogen how much that's a goose chase you know because hydrogen molecules can really throw things off and it's not really understanding your alkalinity or acidity to the potential of your water being able to break down mineralization which is a lot more important and what kind of fish deal with that stuff so when it comes to new keepers i mean they've got to go through the gauntlet of learning one way or another so it's just how you learn and what you start perceiving okay yeah i think uh, like in a couple of my plant talks i've preached very heavily uh, that to me, one of the most important things for people to do is learn their water and then not fight their water. Exactly. It's like when we, when we target chase, like, and I think you put this so perfectly when you're chasing things and you're, you're fighting nature so hard to get what you think is right. It ends up causing disaster more often than it actually is helpful for your fish. Your fish are very adaptable. Even plants are fairly adaptable. I mean, some are, some are very finicky and don't like certain things, but that's, not the norm. Those are rare cases. Most things in our hobby are fairly flexible and can deal with that slightly acidic water or that like liquid rock just as well as long as you don't keep screwing with it. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people don't. I mean, a lot of people who have followed me a long time, they see what I'm doing on my channel. So I, I show a lot of the proof through the pudding, through what I do and have done for years. And back at the old house, I have had, that was liquid rock there is 350 right. plus TDS, super hard water. So I've been through the gauntlet of both hard water and soft water. I switched that whole fish room over from hard water to soft water. And none of those fish were affected. Now, after a while, the bacteria loads get affected because um, the softer the water, the less bacteria loads that can grow. The harder the water and more mineralization, the more that can grow. And you want those bacteria, those good beneficial bacteria to grow. That's like that detritus, that's good stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, oh, essentially, I'm back to what I remember. That's essentially new dirt. That detritus is essentially new dirt. Oh, that's yeah. Alive. Yeah. That's I say, a really cool way to look at it and think about it. Yeah, because I, I like that concept. And all that. There was a, a great question from Way. Um, I'll put it up here. Would you recommend a beginner's first tank to be bare bottom, filterless, sterile tap water without dechlorinator? Well, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. Especially without dechlorinator. You know, that stuff will kill your... Chlorine will kill your fish more than anything. But yeah, no, no filterless or bare bottom. I mean, it's, unless it's, it's a hospital tank, you know. Yeah. It's interesting because, um, you know, Jason from Primetime Aquatics... Right, he did that great video talking about how the amount of chlorine in most tap water, not all, is basically so minimal that it can't actually kill off our bacteria, but it can be very damaging to fish because they're such a much more complex organism, right? It's it's interesting how nature in some ways the things that we're most dependent on, things like our bacteria, are really really tough. For, against certain things that the things that we perceive to be more tough, our fish or our plants are actually really fragile against, you know, it's, it's interesting how nature has that inherent balancing of the scales. 
Well, see, I've seen fish get poisoned by dechlorinated or not getting dechlorinated. What usually happens is they'll go up to the air, they'll gas, and I think it has something to do with the way it captures within their gills. Because if you do get dechlorinator in there in time, then they can rest and bring that stuff back through their gills to where they won't die. But it is interesting how nature really is connected and just the bacteria of everything, you know, and how we fight it so much when we shouldn't. Let's say we're giving it, we're trying to suggest a beginner on where to start with a filterless aquarium. Uh, let's just take the, the one of the gold standard tanks, the 20 gallon long. Right? Yeah. Uh, we, we know we don't need a filter. And we probably don't need an air stone. Uh, let's assume that they're keeping some of our more simple fish, so maybe tetras or damios. Uh, what would you say are the kind of the, the short checklist of things they need to start and find success without a filter in that aquarium? So I would say the first checklist you need is you're going to want substrate because you want to create an environment. Now you could do it bare bottom. The fish just ain't gonna be comfortable. You can do it sterile. As long as the water's chlorinated, it's good water, it's got beneficial bacteria, it's safe or whatnot. You can do that. And tetras and danios are like the number one starter fish most people go to, transports and stuff. Right. So I would recommend personally, although you could do it with nothing, I would personally recommend some substrate like sand or something definitely look at plants I, I know for me it took a while for me to even realize you can put plants into aquariums so some beginners are lucky to understand that um, not all are but once I learned how to do that then I mean plants that's also goes into creating that comfortability for the environment and something for the fish besides that like if you look at all my setups and all my setup builds it's essentially getting a freaking petco tank put some sand in it and calling it, a day, calling it a day. So there's not anything magical that I'm doing. Now what about those those staunch haters of sand like me <laughs> who don't like sand at all? Um, would you transition to would you avoid aqua soil? Let me ask you that question. No, no. I mean aqua soil like it grows plants like crazy. Like the stuff that's in it, like I've seen it work, it, it does work really, really well. So, I mean, if you got the budget for it and you know you want to grow plants real well, it's more for the plants than for the fish, indeed. So, the only fish, too, I do got to mention this. So, some fish are harder to do in no filters due to the fact that they just make your tank look dirty. So, quarry cats, for example. You don't see me with a lot of quarry cats because if I got a sanded tank and no filter, it's just going to be brown, balmy water all day long. <laughs> but if I did have them in crap, it would look all right because they wouldn't be able to kick all that stuff up. But what does the fish prefer? gravel or the sand they love the sand like their natural ability to sift around and kick all that stuff up and search and spend their time doing that that's what they do so it all depends on like what fish you're keeping while you're doing it you know this is a this is a pretty cool question i want to put up well not necessarily a condition but uh so from zen ginger my water has one ppm of ammonia from the tap all tied up with that chlorine, uh, chloramine, neither of which is good for the fishes. So I definitely need water treatment. When you're, when you're dealing with a filterless aquarium, is there any changes that you have to do to the way that you dechlorinate when you are introducing new water? You know, I've never really had to dechlorinate a filterless tank, believe it or not. So, I mean, I have actually dechlorinated a filterless pond. So when you are doing your water change, want to add that dechlorinator while you're doing that water change so you have that flow already going in which will circulate that dechlorinator around so essentially i mean it takes care of itself so there's no like special way to go about that but if you do like say you got multiple tanks or you just don't want to worry about dechlorinator anymore get a carbon block on your house line so where where your plumbing comes in from your house or wherever you got your plumbing central area whatever 
get on that main line before it hits everything and put a carbon block on it. And it's just like those GE house filter that you can get like the sediment filters and stuff. They make a, car a carbon filter and that will take out that ammonia and that chlorine for you. And uh, you won't even have to worry anymore. I had one of those at the old house and loved it. Absolutely loved it. <laughs> one of my uh, people who loves to put jokes in the channel time says Lee, LRB has to be on a green screen he keeps going under the same overpass at the exact same <laughs> interval that's funny <laughs> yeah I'm just messing with y'all on a green screen it's all, it's all a clever ruse my shirt would look pretty funny though yeah that, that would be interesting yeah. uh, from Adam, Adam Lash there's definitely an art factor that requires experience these glass boxes are not inanimate widgets Biology requires observation and time, right? Excellent yeah. conversation, guys. And that's the enjoyment of it. Yeah, I think I think a lot of us were inherently like science nerds in our core, whether we want to admit it or not, if we're into aquariums. One last thing, because we're, we're coming up on an hour and I don't want to eat too much of your time, but we talked a lot about experience. Uh, what do you think is the biggest lesson? And I, I have a suspicion, but I don't want to... I don't want to steal the thunder. What do you think is the biggest lesson you've learned in your time going, moving away from filters and, and trying, whether it's without water changes, with water changes, doing the filterless, more nature style aquariums that you're doing now? Comfortability, definitely comfortability. So like I mentioned, I, the behaviors and stuff I saw after going no filter, I was like, this just makes sense because I started being the fish I started seeing how these fish behaved after I turned the filter off I was like this is more natural more active like the way they're behaving it just made a huge difference to like that's why I wanted to go to no filter like I don't just do it to like glorify it like the fish have like led me down this path nature has led me down this path and the connection to it well cool. yeah I, I assumed because give videos of comfortability a lot I was like I hope that's the right answer because I, I feel like it has to be. Um, and I, I think, you know, each of us has our own, whether you want to keep, keep it a catchphrase or a, a philosophy, a lesson that we want to teach in our hobby. And I think you've got like Be the Fish from Eric Bodrock, right? Um, I, I tend to be a little more plant focused and I have, I have highway robbed that phrase and said, Be the Plant. Right yeah, yeah. when we're thinking about building planted yeah. tanks, think about what a plant wants to be healthy and happy. And I think you have like the perfect meshing of the two, which is comfortability. Yeah. What 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 is it that makes that organism comfortable and happy? Because that's going to lead to it thriving and being successful. Right. I mean, that's the ultimate goal we want for our pet. Right. Absolutely. Uh, okay, we got it. We got it. We talked about this a little bit before the show, but Jeff Kane wants to know what's in the fish box. Oh, okay. Lots and lots and lots of rare fish, so they're not your normal fish. There's lots of killifish, like coral red pencil fish, geophagus wooden millerite. Anyway, you guys, I'm going to make an unboxing video. Jeff, I know you'll be watching. Yeah, so uh, Luke, you'll, you'll catch LRB. You'll get the, the full get down. Uh, he gave me a little preview. Going to be pretty amazing. Won't lie. Won't lie. Uh, great comment here from Atkins Nature Aquarium. Science, biology, chemistry, it's all connected to the fishy world. That's why I love this hobby. Uh, so my my last thing, uh, of course, if for some reason you don't know Lucas, LRB Aquatics, lrbaquatics.com. You can find him on YouTube. Where else can we find you? I mean, Facebook, you have your own website. Where else can we find you, Lucas? I'm on TikTok and Instagram as well. Sometimes you'll see me in the clubs. The fish clubs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other clubs, too. You can never know where you'll find Lucas. Yeah, you won't find me in the regular clubs. <laughs> Not usually. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, so, you know, watch. If you if you have to know what amazing fish are lurking in those boxes the entire time, Lucas is going to have an unboxing. Make sure you check that out. Your, your stream's uh, Friday nights, right? Yeah, yeah, Friday night, yeah. So there you go. For everybody, so they can ask me more questions. So maybe you have a question about what we discussed. Always feel free to ask me. Yeah, go in, check Comment Lucas out. Tons, tons of knowledge gets dropped. I've been a casual lurker many times. I've actually had you out of the background while I'm editing videos furiously for the next day. So. <laughs> 
All right, gang. Uh, no, the last I thing I'm gonna. No, dude. I I hope we get to see each other again soon. Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna get to travel this year, but I'm hoping I can go to at least one convention, and hopefully it's the same one you'll be at. So, because every time oh, we've gotten man. to sit down and just chat for a little bit, it's been fun. Do you know which convention you're gonna maybe go to? I'm trying to figure it out. Um, I've I've had between when I had got laid off last year and then had to do my dog surgery, it's screwed with like all my fun money. So it's trying to figure out what what fits right in the budget and whether or not I can travel this year. I mean, if I can't next year, I definitely will. It'll be one of those things. Yeah. Well, I was wanting to come back up to uh, go up at some point too. Maybe I'll hit you up when I do that. Yeah, dude. If you're out here, I'll I'll totally take a day off and come hang out. Awesome. Awesome. Dude. I appreciate you touching these subjects because it really needed to happen, and I'm glad you're man enough to do it. You're an awesome person, dude. You're an awesome. Person. Uh, no, dude. Thank you so much. Like, I've I've been waiting to do the specific like, have you cracked the code video for a while? I just wanted the right time to talk about it because I think what you're doing is fascinating, and the, I want more people to be exposed to it because I want that that flow of ideas and concept. Yeah, and that fascination. I mean, that's what makes the hobby so enjoyable. That's right, that want to explore is so cool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what led me to all of it, really. All right, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta help Peplin out because he apparently doesn't know. What do you feed oh, your Pep fish, Lucas? Peplin knows. I know Peplin knows. Good old Tetracolor tropical granules. Now I know yeah. it's not the best food, but there is a reason why I do feed it because it is like the McDonald's of food. It's not the best, but when you're feeding over 300 aquariums and rotten food is one of the biggest things that will screw a fish up in their gut biome. So I can see the tetracolor tropical granules if I were to overfeed and stuff. And, you know, it's, it's very utilitarian for me. But yes, Peplin, I know you already know, but thank you, Peplin. <laughs> I'm just gonna put this out there, passing when this is not happening. It would be unfair for one of us, and I'm not sure which one that is. <laughs> Probably me. We can all win. That's the joy about the hobby. More people that win in this hobby, we all win. You know, because yeah. there's so many people that come into the hobby and go out of it because it's either too much to maintain, too much work, or just don't have time for it. And that's why keeping aquariums the way I do makes it a lot easier for people to keep aquariums without having that stress of like, oh, I've got to be here to do that or I got to do this to like feel so chained to it. Yeah, yeah. I I think that's a great like final lesson there is there is a way to reduce the amount of work we have to do or find a way that fits the time we have. Right. right, right, because aquascapers, you know, they love to get into their tanks and, like, fiddle around. So everybody's different on how they like to keep their aquariums. But, like, for some people that, you know, they want to try to make it as easy as possible. Absolutely. Uh, Lucas, thank you so much, dude. I really appreciate you having a willingness to jump on and chat with me and tell me why I'm, I'm wrong about everything in the world. Oh. <laughs> no, but, we're dude, all it's been... here. It's been learning. such a blast, and uh, hopefully we get to see each other again soon. Uh, before we go, gang, I just want to put out one more thing. Um, for those of my community, you'll know one of our own members, Laura, who's in chat. Her her dog has an injury that requires some surgery. We've been trying to help her out because she's on disability. If you have the opportunity to and you haven't already, uh, there's a quick link in the chat to her GoFundMe for Valkyrie. Uh, I previously did a match, so the first $500 worth of the donations I personally matched. Uh, so we've gotten it over a thousand, which is huge to help her. But if anybody can, even a buck goes a long way to help somebody out. So if you have an opportunity, please give Valkyrie a little bit of help so that poor pupper can get back to normal, kind of like my Shantoto did a little over a year ago. Lucas, again, thank you so much, dude. Check Lucas out Fridays. And as always, my friends, thank you so much for watching and stay awesome. See you guys.